Um, so as Jacob said, Ares is a vertically integrated developer. Uh, our company has been around for just about 30 years. Um, we do pretty much any type of project that looks like it has an opportunity for a developer, we'll look at it. Um, our primary focus up until about 2005 was uh, single tenant build to suit leases for GSA. Um, what I would like to, for everyone to get out of my discussion is why does it make sense to build sustainable buildings, develop those, how to sell that to your clients in, instead of it being a cost adder, how is it cost neutral or how does it benefit their company. Uh, what are the economic benefits that come back to developers and owners and also tenants in sustainable buildings? And I would like to propose that it makes sense for both existing facilities as well as new construction and making existing facilities sustainable as well. Um, people often ask, how did you get into sustainability? It seem, seems like it was a trend. It's kind of holding. Um, being a developer for the General Services Administration, in 1997, we were awarded a project in Albuquerque, New Mexico for the U.S. Forest Service to develop their regional headquarters. They were originally in this building that you see, along with a couple of other agencies. One of those agencies was the Social Security Administration. Um, the building that building is the Forest Service building. It was completed in 99. This building, the top floor, is the Social Security Administration. When we developed the Forest Service building, um, they managed a, a certain region of the United States quantified in millions of acres. They moved from their existing building into their new facility, and they realized they had a lot of people that were standing around. Their responsibilities, were not as great as they thought they should have been, and so they, along with GSA, invited Carnegie Mellon to come look at why was the transition from a new building, why, why did they have so much extra time for their people. They began to study the metrics of the productivity of the government workers, which is the perfect thing when it comes to an office worker to study because they produce the same widget every single day. They do the same thing and they're very specific in what they do, and once they're done, they pass it off to the next person. So it was very easy for them to quantify the productivity, what increased for the Forest Service. Over the next three years, that region of the Forest Service, they, they stole, I'll call it stole, from the other regions that they came in contact with, 47% more area or acreage of Forest Service to manage. Same number of people that was there before. They just increased the amount of area that they were looking over. GSA then asked the question, how, how does this happen? Why does it happen? And so they engaged in a study with Carnegie Mellon. And at the same time, we had just been awarded this, a new building to build. It's a shared lease between the Bureau of Reclamation and the Social Security Administration. The, uh, Social Security Administration had a mandate that they either increase the number of cases that they were seeing per year or they lose people through attrition and layoff. Um, so in concert with Carnegie Mellon, we approached this project of what, are, what were the things that benefited the Forest Service that could be applied to the Social Security Administration. When the project was done, it doesn't, there's nothing fancy about this building. It's a typical Albuquerque office building. The things that we did on the interior and the exterior of the building were all things that were simply requested by the tenant. Uh, the numbers that you see on the screen, these were all produced from the study that Carnegie Mellon did. Um, they increased the amount of square footage they had by 19%. They increased the cost of their space by 80%, or put, which put them in the whole little over $300,000. Their productivity increased 19.6% or a benefit back to the taxpayers of $1.7 million. So before they were handling 78 cases per employee per year, that went up to 97 cases per employee per year. 
So a net savings to you and I as taxpayers, $1.4 million. It's hard to argue with that as not being a reality. Um, like I said, the government, they make the same widget, the same person does it, it happens over and over. It was easy for them to be studied. It was easy to document the productivity that they gained. The building has been up and running now for eight years, and they continue to manage that same amount of caseload. It wasn't a, we're in a new building and it happened for a year. It happens continually year after year. Uh, so our company took that philosophy and we applied it to what well, we, we started out as a focus on people. We called it a client effective or user effective laboratory spec office building. Um, focus was on sustainability, but not sustainability for building sake, sustainability for employee sake and what is the people cost versus the building cost, and how do you offset some of those things when it comes to sustainability. So I'd like to give you my example, and we'll call this example of Joe. Joe occupies a 10 by 10 office or cube in a typical office building. His employer moves them to a new office building. He implies that he lives in that same 10 by 10 space. The rent that gets paid for that space is $20 a year or $2,000 in annual rent that gets paid. And Joe makes $50,000. Just by increasing the daylighting and allowing thermal comfort to take place in Joe's 10 by 10 workspace, his productivity jumps by 4%. So 4% times Joe's $50,000 is $2,000 savings. His, his real estate that he occupies just paid for itself. You can look up some other uh, studies that have been done. Carnegie Mellon has kind of led those studies. Typical increase that you see in productivity when green features are added to a building and incorporated into the systems that are utilized range somewhere between 8 and 12 percent productivity. So from an employer point of view, being in a sustainable environment makes a lot of sense from the return they get on the investment that they spend on the people that they that work for them. So there are a number of things that go into meeting those metrics. Um, this picture hopefully sums those things up. If I can point to them, natural daylighting. It's very easy to put windows in a building. It's not so easy to get a corporate to change its environment and move the offices inside of the exterior wall and put the cubes on the outside so the daylight goes all the way in to everybody that occupies the space. Thermal comfort is a big issue in uh, the majority of projects that, that I've worked on. It's probably one of the biggest issues that tenants worry about. It also is a big issue for building owners because of operational costs that go along with that. Um, Another thing that's very important is views or visual stimulation. It makes a lot more sense for someone to get up from their desk, walk around, chat with everybody else, get a cup of coffee, all of those things. It's, uh, it's been documented. If someone can look up and have an outside view, that 10, 15 minute wander through the office to break up the monotony of whatever they're doing is, re is restricted back down to about two minutes of someone just staring out the window. Uh, another thing is acoustic privacy. Being able to do your work in your queue without having to listen to your neighbor on the other side of the wall, the person behind you, those type of things. And then the ability to be flexible in your space. How many of you live in a cube environment and you would like to rearrange your team, you would like to rearrange the way the office is set up, when you look at the logistics of moving people around, rearranging the cubes, tearing down walls, building new walls, nobody ever moves. If you can set up furniture systems, wall systems that are movable, that are flexible, that could be done over a weekend, the ability to regroup into different work groups, rearrange the, the way that the people are sitting, whatever it may be to be more efficient in the workplace, those things all have benefits to the productivity. And the last thing is the indoor air quality. 
How many of you have ever sat in a building where there's no air movement, but you can sure hear the HVAC system is doing something? You can smell the VOCs in the paint. You got the new car smell. You got the new carpet smell. You got the smell of whatever they're cooking down the hallway at lunchtime, whatever those things may be. If you can limit those and, and increase the quality of the air that actually passes through the space, the productivity of the people that are actually occupying the space goes up. So what are some of the benefits that go for an owner for doing these things? Reduce operating costs. That also goes all the way down to the tenant level if you're a triple net lease. If you're a full service lease, you can get some benefits as the owner. Decrease vacancy and retention of clients. People in a healthy building tend to stay there longer. Uh, there's marketing advantages and free PR. Uh, people know when they're in a sustainable building because people market it to death. I'm lead whatever. I met this criteria. People are, want to share that. They want people to know that the building was made to meet those. There's opti optimized life cycle performance from systems lasting longer, having less annual maintenance costs, things like that. Um, an increased building valuation or cap rate, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Benefits for a tenant, uh, reduced absentee turnover, a uh, healthy workplace for employee satisfaction, reduced liability and compliance list for larger corporations, and it also benefits them. A lot of the Fortune 500 companies have to put a sustainability report out now that goes along just with all of their other financial reports. Sustainability report, the space that they actually occupy plays a big role in that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Signature Center. Signature Center um, was a test lab. It was a spec office building that we put together. It's in the west side of Denver in an office park called Denver West. It's this area right here. It was done in the mid-70s. Uh, there's approximately 1.4 million square feet of mid-rise office building one to three stories. Um, all hip roof, all shake roof, all very little windows. The, uh, the average rent in Denver West when we started the Signature Center project was $11 triple net. So that's what, that was the competition that we had. Um, the average floor plate size in Denver West is about 20,000 square feet. So we came back with a five-story building, which is 285,000 feet contained within the building. 186 of that is rentable. The rest of the space is structured parking, which is pretty much unheard of in a suburban office setting. Um, we built the building, designed the building, developed the building. The construction cost for this project is $109 a square foot. The project was certified LEED Platinum, Core Shell in 2007, and LEED Platinum for commercial interiors in 2009. We did that out for 109 bucks a foot. What is the typical uh, cost per square foot for possible developments of that type of office building? Okay, so the question is what's a typical or comparable cost per square foot in this area for similar space? For a lead platinum space, if I told you, you'd get real upset. But if I told you standard office market cost at that point in time was $125 to $128 a square foot. That was a typical cost. Um, there are a couple of things that we looked at when we did the Signature Center that we had to look at differently than a typical developer. And we had to look at for cost savings versus cost increase. One of those was in the HVAC system. Um, the building actually has two systems, uh, and both systems are underfloor delivery. So we have underfloor air delivery for the core of the building, and at the perimeter, five feet of the building, we looked at that as a completely separate zone, taking care of just the skin load of the building, and we did that with hydronic both hot water in the baseboard and cold water above in a system called chilled beams. Um, we use the, the passive nature of the hydronic 
instead of having fans to control that, it's simply controlled by natural ventilation, hot air rises, cold air falls, capture hot air, it, it pressurizes the space, forces the cold air to fall. It's a pretty controlled system. Um, in our case, having two systems created a, a annual reduction in energy, energy costs of almost 38%. Um, it in, increased the indoor air quality because it's a single pass system instead of your standard turbulent system. The air comes out of the floor, passes through the space. We stratify the air so you're cool up until about six foot six, and then it warms naturally. That air then returns back into the RTUs and sent back through the space. The other thing that the HVAC system did is allow us to lower our floor plates to 13 feet floor to floor. The, as you all saw, the building is majority of is glass. It allows us to get five floors, save 10 feet off of the height of the building at 85 bucks a foot for the skin at 1,000 lineal feet around the building times 10. That pays for a second HVAC system and it returns money back to the owner. So that was the purpose for looking at two systems. The thermal comfort that comes out of the system is every single cube has its own diffuser in the floor. If somebody's hot, they can open it and get more air. If somebody's cold, they can close it off, turn off their air. If you need more air, simply pull up a floor tile, put a new floor tile in with a diffuser, you've got more air. Totally controllable, very easy for people to be satisfied for whatever their temperature need may be. The other system was natural daylighting. Um, we were the first building in the United States to design with SolarVan 70XL. Um, they actually, we got a, a reduction in the cost for the quantity that we bought because of the, it was the first product project that was going to use that much quantity and they wanted to test it in our facility. We um, provide everybody in our building with a view of the outside and we're right up against the foothills so it's not really a bad view to look at. Um, we can penetrate natural daylight into our building a minimum of 45 feet but in some places up to 120 feet through the windows. Uh, we have interior and exterior solar shades and light shelves. Um, we reduce the light load in the building by two-thirds of what a typical office building would be, um, which is a, a huge savings when you look at the amount of energy that's spent in an office building just for lights. So what were the benefits to the developer? Um, the building was 100% pre-leased before we broke ground. The average rent was $18 a square foot, triple net, so $7 more than the surrounding competition. Construction cost was $109, roughly $11 less than anybody else was building office buildings at that point in time. People always ask me, what was the cost for the lead certification and for all of the sustainable items that you put into the building. It was just over 1%. That paid for consultants, that paid for upcharges from ordering chill beams from Europe, that paid for all, anything that had to do with Elite Platinum certification. The big benefit came from the way that we had modeled the building at a return of seven and a half cap. We sold the building in December of 2007 to a German REIT or a 5.6 cap. I'll let you guys do the math on that. What about for those of us who don't know how to do the math on that? What is that? <laughs> that means we made an extra $14 million on the sale of the building. Okay, so the next project I want to talk about is Muskogee Community Hospital. It's a completely different building type um, and a completely different arrangement um, of how the development that was done and the reason why sustainability was brought into the project. Uh, those of you familiar with doctors, they have what's called the Physician's Creed and, and that Physician's Creed says do no harm. Um, do no harm came into play in the Muskogee Community Hospital after the development had started. Um, 
but it played a major role in how the project finished. Muskogee Community Hospital was designed under the Lead for Healthcare rating system. It did not, Lead for Healthcare did not happen, and so we have a new construction, Lead for Gold. We're the only, we are, well, let me put it this way, we are the highest certified for-profit hospital in the United States. There are hospitals that are certified LEED Platinum. They are not for profit and they have a lot different return requirement to the people that invest in those projects. Um, we were the first hospital in the United States to receive an Energy Star rating and we are the first ground source geothermal hospital in the United States. Uh, the Muskogee story has started two years before I got involved and some of my teammates got involved. Uh, the city of Muskogee approached a developer as a fee developer to help them find a replacement for their existing hospital. Um, through design efforts and through moving through the project, uh, they redesigned it on three different sites within the city. They looked at three different models for bed towers, number of beds. They went through the project multiple times to the point that everybody was so frustrated with what made the most sense for the community that the city walked away and said they were not going to replace their existing hospital. They would take their money and try and fix up or revamp certain parts of the hospital. At that point, 25 doctors from the hospital decided that they would pool their money together and they would develop their own physician-owned hospital. Uh, they connected with a different developer who said he would work with them, help them through the process in order to get the hospital developed. Um, the city denied them the opportunity to actually build a hospital within the city limits. And so they moved it to an unincorporated property just outside of the city limits, which from this airplane, airplane view, the city limit does that. So they literally crossed over the fence to build their hospital. And then the city denied them access to the sanitary sewer system. Um, no question this was a big political issue that was going on between the developer, the doctors, and the city. Um, so the hospital is 100,000 square feet. It's certified LEED Gold and Energy Star rated. It has 45 licensed patient rooms, four ORs, three endoscopic procedure rooms, a level four emergency department, and it was financed through traditional debt and equity, and they used new market tax credits uh, for that equity piece. Um, just some information about an Energy Star rating. It's based upon a scoring system, but it also incorporates the equipment that you buy, and it measures the efficiency of the project over a longer period of time. So you can get your rating and then you have to maintain that rating for a period of years. The, um, the LEED Gold cert cert certification, um, it was like I said, it was designed under LEED for Healthcare. Um, LEED for Healthcare didn't come online when this project was happening and so we did it under new construction. We achieved 41 points in the, that system. So a couple of things that are interesting or for the sustainability of the project. The first one, that right there is the sewer treatment system. Um, we took all of the sanitary waste out of a hospital, which you can imagine what's going on there. We separated it into what was biohazard, and that was handled right at the side of the hospital. The sanitary sewer was taken out across the sites to what we called the lagoon. It was processed and then it was pumped into a lagoon. It was certified by the county to be drinkable. Um, the doctors didn't feel conf confident in returning it back to the hospital. So they use it for irrigation purposes. Um, for staff and office areas, they use it to flush toilets, all that kind of stuff. So it's true gray water. Um, the other piece is the energy and atmosphere.
Um, it makes a lot of sense to drill a geothermal field in this area of Oklahoma. There are several buildings in the city that had that. When we talked to the engineers, they just said we had never thought about it. Um, we had our site tested, and it was one of the optimal sites in the region for that. We approached a, a commercial mechanical equipment manufacturer about making some tweaks to their system so that it could be utilized in a healthcare application. They were happy to make those tweaks in order to for the marketing that they uh, got out of the project. We drilled the entire site that is a parking lot uh, with geothermal wells uh, put in the system from a hospital which is typically an energy hog. We have 22 percent savings from energy over a standard office building. We, there's nothing really to compare it to to a hospital because no hospital wants to tell you how much energy they actually spend on heating and cooling. So we, we made our comparison with an office building. Um, looks like a pretty standard hospital, standard finishes, standard procedure rooms, pretty typical bed tower configuration. Um, one of the benefits that came from the mechanical system that we used and really focusing on indoor air quality, it's another single pass air system. We added ultraviolet sterilization to the air. The hospital has been open since 2009 and there has not been a secondary infection in that hospital since its opening. That's a huge, huge deal for a hospital. Um, so some of the things that go into that, the average construct or the construction costs were 30 percent below the industry average. Somebody asked me what does that mean exactly? Uh, typically hospitals are measured on the cost per bed. Across the United States, the average cost for a hospital bed, new construction, is 1.1 to 1.3 million dollars. We build our hospital for just over seven hundred thousand dollars per bedroom. So there's a huge cost savings in the way that we approach the project and the philosophy that went into uh, building the project. The other thing is the cost for lead. Once again, all of the costs for sustainability items, consultants, fees, everything, less than 1% of the total construction cost. The cost for Energy Star because of the equipment and the cost of medical equipment is roughly 2% of the cost of the entire development. What are the benefits for the owner? The benefits for the owner is doctor, the doctors realize they're not good at managing a hospital. So they signed a lease with an experienced hospital operator, a 40 year lease. The return on the investment that they put in is a 28% cash on cash return for the doctors. For those of you that are developers, that's a good return. Um, the last project that I want to talk about is the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area Rainbow Bridge National Monument Headquarters. It's located in Page, Arizona. It's a single tenant GSA lease building. It was originally built in 1991. It's 25,000 square feet of office space. Um, the reason for the sustainability is the lease was renewed with GSA for another 20-year lease, and this project is certified lead silver for commercial interiors. So this is just an image of Page, Arizona. It's considered one of the most remote cities in the lower 48 states. It has a population that varies between winter and summer of 3,500 to 8,000 people in the summertime. It's an extreme high desert climate. 100 plus degrees average in the summertime, low 40s in the wintertime, on a good year, five inches of precipitation. So my question, or what I'd like you to think about is how do you do a sustainable project in an existing building in a remote location where you don't have the, the accessibility of consultants, people that have ever done this type of work before, people that understand this type of work before, why would you want to do this when the building is just fine the way it is? We're all happy. We go to work every day. 
part of the reason that is is because the concepts of a building and how it was built in 1991 do not work with the mission of the government in 2012. Those concepts were it needed to look like a typical suburban office building. It needed to have grass, it needed to have flowering trees, it needed to have flowers that bloom throughout the year. Um, there was no insulation put up in the ceiling um, because nobody was up there. Nobody paid attention to what that was. He used black roofing materials in a city that probably gets close to 280 days of sun. Um, the entire landscape, high water usage, non-native vegetation. Um, the original developer actually had vegetation trucked from Denver to Page and installed because he couldn't get it locally and he wanted it to look like a typical suburban office building. Um, there was no thought for, for water conservation. You can see the sprinklers there. The sprinklers, there are six zones of sprinkler, sprinklers. They ran 20 minutes every single day of the year. Summer, winter, constantly. You see that big tree there? Its roots were about an inch below the sod. It fed off of the sprinkler system. And I'm pretty sure that those two hours of watering going on every day were just for that tree. Um, the insulation in the walls was R11. Um, and so anywhere that there wasn't vegetation for sun, the wall would heat up and then it would radiate in about 2 o'clock. The space in the building was somewhere between 78 and 82 degrees, and there was no way to control it. So what do you do in 2012 to solve that? We got a um, thermal reflective barrier. We took the entire space apart, section by section, because the building had to remain occupied. We took the ceiling down. We put the, bar the barrier up to keep the heat from coming in, but also to keep the cool air from going out. We changed the temperature in that plenum. In the summertime, it averaged about 115 degrees. We reduced it to 80 degrees. For those of you that don't know what that means, your optimal RTU operating temperature in a plenum space is 85 degrees or less. So imagine you're cooling this air down 55 degrees. You're running it through. And uninsulated plenum space that's 115 by the time it gets delivered it's already at 75 degrees. So there's a huge issue there. We changed out all of the T12 light fixtures to T8s. We got rid of all the magnetic ballast and we exchanged those for electronic ballast. Um, and then we insulated all the spaces that didn't have insulation and we looked in every single wall, every floor, every ceiling and found space after space after space where the insulation hadn't been put in in the original construction. Some of the other things that we did, we zero the entire site. Uh, we changed the roof material, the flat roofs, from black to white. Um, we reduced the water usage. Now we water, uh, we do the property management on this building. We water the vegetation for 15 minutes a month per zone. Um, it was amazing to see what happened. You can see the picture of the Roadrunner. Um, actually, the wildlife returned back to this space. It, before, when it was all green, it kind of stood as a, an emblem of suburbia. Uh, when we returned it to Xeriscape, the snakes came back, the coyotes came back, the Roadrunners came back, the rabbits came back, all of those things who I would have thought would have loved to be there eating the grass and hanging out. They were all living in their natural environment where they understood what they were up against and where they could get their food. Um, another thing we did is we replaced all of the plumbing fixtures with water efficient. Uh, for a reduction interior, 42% water savings. We replaced all of the existing RTUs with high efficiency RTUs. The building owner had a plan of replacing one unit per year over the next 10 years. We did it all at once. Um, and we reused all of the existing systems furniture and office furniture that was in the building. The uh, agency that occupies the building, they had set aside $350,000 to, to get all new furniture because they sure it, wasn't, it was not going to fit when we got done with the renovation. They reused every single piece of it. 
So what were the benefits and the paybacks uh, from this project? What the owner got was five-year payback on his new HVAC system. It's also brand new, so his annual operating budget of maintenance and repairs went virtually to zero. Two-year payback on the new electrical systems and lighting. Three-year payback just from the water on the new landscaping. Uh, they also were able to achieve a 20-year lease, which is pretty good if you're in the development world with the federal government who's not well, today they may be bad to bank on, but typically they're not that bad to bank on. They always pay their rent on time the day it's due. Um, he was able to increase his lease rate over the previous rate. Um, it's a full service lease, so the portion of the operational savings are flowing back to the owner. Uh, and the cost of the lead sustainability and the new construction, all those things that went into it was just at 1%. So a combined savings to the owner as, as he modeled it over the number of years in, in the lease from previous years, he started out from day one at 41% savings. So there are a couple of things that I'd like you to think about uh, when it comes to sustainable development. The first thing is know your market. People always say location, location, location. It's absolutely true with sustainability as well. If you know what are the viable systems for the area, what is the market demand for people that want to be in a sustainable building? All of those things. It makes it very, very easy for you to sell that to your potential clients and tenants. Sustainability can have big returns. Um, I talked about the cap rates. I talked about the paybacks. I talked about the benefits to the occupants. Those are all big returns. Um, the costs are neg negligible in the grand scheme of things. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today, typically a developer when they build their pro forma and they model a project financially, they look at a snapshot. If you break that down and start looking at what are my operational savings, how long am I going to hold the building, what tenants can I attract based off of the productivity, based off of it being sustainable, the way that you start to look at the cost of sustainability it becomes very negligible in the overall cost of the project and the life cost of the project. And I think that, I, for me at least, sustainability works in new and it works in existing buildings. And I would probably say it's easier in, in existing buildings if you have the appropriate design and team put together in order to pull off a project like that. Uh, one thing that I will say, all of these projects were design, done in a collaborative design-build manner. Um, I know there are oftentimes challenges when you have an owner who has a vision and an architect who has a vision and a contractor who has a different vision, trying to get all those people on the same page to incorporate all the qualities that you want in your building and for your tenant and in your development. So creating a team that's as collaborative as possible makes gives you the ability to get closer to the goals that you have in developing a sustainable building. Um, so from that, uh, I just would hope that you guys would start to think differently about the way that you develop your buildings, the way you build your buildings, and the way that you model them financially and the returns that you can gain from doing sustainability. Are there any questions?